Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Frenemies. Joined, as always, by David Swar. I am DJ Cox. And this week, we have another former teammate of ours from TTU, Brad Raby. It's good to have you this week, buddy. Glad to be on, guys. Thanks for coming on, man. It's good to have you. I haven't seen seen you in a long time. It's good to see you. Like 20 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is how you see people 2020 style, I guess, right? It's crazy, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, guys, uh, as always, uh, tonight's episode is brought to you by the White Sauce. Uh, Coach Hall made this stuff. He bottled it up. Go to his Facebook page. Look up the White Sauce. I promise you won't regret it. Show us that again, David. Look here. He's even got his own webpage now, thewhitesauce.org. Bunch of good discounts and stuff you can uh, – packages you can buy. So go check it out. I didn't realize it, DJ. You can put this stuff on pizza. Who knew? Yeah. On anything. Yeah. And I got one question for you guys. You, I don't know if you were a part of this, Brad, or not, but do you guys remember when Coach has over at his house to eat crawfish? Do you all remember that? Yes, sir. Listen, the only thing that can make crawfish taste good is the white <laughs> sauce. <laughs> so I uh, I work the uh, – concessions for the basketball team a lot and like people would just come to the basketball game so sure. because coach hall was cooking barbecue with the white sauce absolutely so here at the game it's just like when the concession stand open <laughs> when is the, when is the barbecue can i just have a couple white sauce no doubt it's that good <laughs> that's awesome man that's so true so coach there's your love man um for the white sauce get you some of that i did not know they had a website david pretty cool man yeah very nice right out there all right, guys. So, man, this is this is the time of year. This is uh, this is it. This is the World Series this week. Uh, our favorite time of the year by far. We just went through the playoffs here, and we're down to the end. So, we're going to begin our show by talking about the National League and the American League Championship Series tonight. Um, what series they obviously both were. Both went seven games. About as, about as awesome a series you can ask for as baseball fans. I'm hoping the World Series is going to be the same way. Um, so, David, why don't you go ahead and uh, kick us off with the with the first series that we had, the Rays and the Astros, man. Go for it, buddy. So, DJ, as a Yankees fan, there's no two teams that I can hate worse in the American League right now <laughs> than the Rays and the Astros. But this made for a really good series, man. Very interesting. Uh you know, the Rays go up 3-0, and the fighting Dusty Bakers come back and tie it up and take it to seven games. And that, uh, you know, the Astros, man, they're a scrappy bunch. And uh, I thought it was hilarious. I was watching some clips today, and a uh, dude from ESPN stepped all over himself. He was talking to Carlos Correa, talking about the, his game-winning home run, and he said it almost seemed like you knew uh, what was coming. <laughs> and so I wanted to go, yeah, he did. No, I'm just kidding. I'll get off of that. But really good series, man. So one thing that I noticed in this series, we got some stars in the making, I think, on both sides, man. Randy Arozarena, who was the uh, MVP, had an awesome series. Uh, started out in game one, a pitching duel. And the other guy I want to talk about a little bit here was Framber Valdez. Man, he looks like the real deal. Two great starts uh, for the Astros. And you got to kick yourself if you're an Astros fan. They were just a pitcher or two short. Um, you know, if you throw Garrett Cole back in that rotation or uh, Justin Verlander, man, this thing might end a little bit differently. But two to one in the first game. Uh, again, Framber throws uh, six innings, eight Ks. Uh, Ian Snell, uh, five innings. And then the Rays mix and match with the bullpens for four innings uh, to get the win. Altuve homered, Rosarena homered, and Zunino had an RBI. Uh, another big thing to talk about in this series was Altuve. Got the yips a little bit, DJ. Uh what do you guys think about that? I mean, what is that something to worry about in the future, you think? Or is that something that's just going to work its way out? Well, uh, it was, that was really weird to see, no doubt. Um, you don't really see that from Altuve. I had heard something that somebody said he was possibly hurt. That doesn't make any sense that he would be hurt, because if he did something in that game, then you DH him later on, you know, so that didn't really make any sense to me. I don't know why you would throw him out there at second if something was wrong with him. I think it was definitely a case of the yips. And it was kind of weird to see him do that. And then I, I don't know. I, I thought a lot of people was kind of funny trying to blame injury, and it definitely wasn't an injury. It was definitely just a bad case of the knob blocks, and he he yeah, struggled sure. there pretty bad. Brad, what do you think? 
Well, he, he, he struggled really early in the season hitting as well. I think there was so much pressure from the controversy on him that there was a part of him that thought, I, I've got to perform even better to, to somehow know to justify that I wasn't this like MVP caliber player or that I was. And, uh, I, you know, baseball is unique. Uh, compared to football or basketball because there is so much time for you to sit and think about what you've done mm-hmm. that it, that it's in basketball it's easy to move on like you turn the ball over and you've got to play right away but in baseball you you boot, you boot the ball or whatever it sits with you it sits with you and then next thing you know you're you're, you're going knob lock or rick and kill and it becomes this kind of mental thing and so yeah, I think there's there, – for whatever reason, it seems like he amongst all the other – like Correa seemed to just kind of, you know, shake it off and didn't care. The more you hated him, the better he did. But it really seemed to bother Altuve early in the season at the plate, but then obviously here in the ALCS with the glow. Yeah, it's definitely something to watch down the line. I mean, maybe the further we get away from all that talk and the further he gets away from Chen high fastballs, You know, maybe he kind of forgets about it or whatever, and it all goes away. But it is interesting. Like you said, I mean, that haunted Chuck Knobloch for years. Obviously, it drove Rick and Kill out of baseball. So, it'll just be interesting to see how Altuve handles it going forward. Um, Game two went to the Rays as well. Um, Charlie Morton, my man Charlie Morton, free agent this year, guys. It's going to be interesting to see where he ends up. It wouldn't bother me at all if he had pinstripes on next year. Uh, Five shutout innings. Uh, Lance McCullers. Also a stud, seven innings, 11 Ks. He took the loss. Um, Zunino homered, which is – Zunino has had a great playoff series, guys, after a really rough year. I'm thinking he hit about 120 or 130. He's had some big hits and big home runs. Uh, Manuel Margot had three RBIs as well, and uh, Correa had a home run. Uh, game three, uh, Yarborough started. Rays win again, five to two. He goes five innings, five Ks. And then they use five different deliv- uh, relievers to mix and match get the other four innings. Uh, Joey Wendell had two RBIs. Hunter Renfro had a big two-out uh, double uh, to drive in two runs. Urquidy took the loss, five innings, one run. Um, and uh, Enoli Parides had a third of an inning where he gave up three runs. He kind of blew the game uh, there. Um, so they go into that, go into game four down 3-0. You think it's over. And again, uh, DJ, the fighting Dusty Bakers, man. They fight there. DJ loves Dusty Baker. In case you didn't know that, Brad, he's such a great manager, probably will be in the Hall of Fame. He was trying to make a World Series appearance, first time in 18 years. And so, uh, anyway, the Astros, four to three in game four. A Rosarina homers, Altuve and Springer homer, and Zach Grinke pitches six uh, good innings. But I don't know if you guys heard the kerfuffle at the end of, uh, ga- of that game. Grinke was kind of calling out the Astros. Did you guys catch that? Yeah, he yeah. said that trust him had the early hook there and uh i don't know what to think about Grinky guys he kind of seems to be a little bit of of a head case but he's a hall of famer so i don't i don't know yeah. much about that so uh, I, I think when you're that good in your mind you're that good no matter where you're at in your career like in zach's mind it's still like 2012 and right. he's you know he's pitching with the royal still um and, you, and everybody wants to be left in. And, of course, when, when you don't know what was going to happen, it's easier to look back and call yeah. the shots. I think, I think a lot of these guys are such perfectionists. I'm reading a book now. I've been talking to DJ about it, uh, about Joe Torrey. And, you know, towards the end of Randy Johnson's career, he was a Yankee there for two years. And Joe Torrey talked about what a head case he was. Mm. Anytime he got hit, he was convinced he was tipping his pitches. Uh, just super worried about everything. And I think Grinky's a little bit the same way. He's just so good. He doesn't know what it feels like to fail. And so if he starts failing at something or gets pulled early, he thinks something's bad wrong and it just works on him. But Well, there's a psychology to it in baseball and other things. They, there's a saying that goes, you, you put up with someone who's high maintenance if they're, they've got high output. Like if, if when there's no output, the, the high maintenance people are gone. But like Randy Johnson or I remember the old football coach, Jimmy Johnson, people com- complained that he treated Troy Aikman and Emmett Smith different than the other players. And he said, of course I did. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and so, yeah, so I, I think you're right. But the, the high maintenance folks often are the, are the people who give the highest yield and so you just try to deal with it. But it, I think there's probably some prima donna that you just have to manage there. 
Yeah. So, yeah. so Brad, I want to kind of throw this on. D- David had brought up uh, Dusty Baker. I just want a couple seconds on Dusty here. So this is interesting since you uh, you got partial Reds love here too. So yeah. Be, you know, Dusty's the the you know the man as far as the regular season goes with the Reds. I think he had a bunch of ninety one seasons as well. But he'd get into the playoffs, man, and it's over. Like yeah. Once again, it's over now. You know, and I just, I it just it just doesn't he doesn't get over that hump and it's kind of like you know t- certain teams that like the twins you know they don't get over over that playoff hump ever dusty baker as a manager doesn't get over the playoff hump ever the a's don't get over the playoff hump it's just something that's with certain teams and certain yeah managers. well no. so here's my question my, my question is dj when you when you coach do you like put wrist armbands on like do you get like the six inch armband when you're coaching so I used to not do that, but I do now. I do now. We talked about this a whole lot. Yeah, we do because, man, this whole science stealing thing is real. It's real in high school. It's real in college. It's real yeah. In pros. And these young girls, these little softball girls, man, they got it down with their little wristbands. Yeah. All right. So here's my, th- here's my, here's my theory on Dusty Baker's regular season versus postseason success is some guys will always be judged by their failures um, more than the, the opponent's success. So here's, here's Dusty Baker's biggest problem in the postseason is he has had opponents that are just better. I mean, you think about, you think about guys who had to manage against the mid-90s to, mid, to the mid-2000 Yankees. Like the, and you, you lose, you lose, you lose, you lose. But you lost to, like, the, one of the greatest decades of baseball ever. And so, yeah, it's on you. But sometimes, I mean, it's the, it's, it's the Buffalo Bills, you know. They, they couldn't get over the, the hurdle in the championship. Um, sometimes you just run into better players. And I don't know. Like, with, in the Reds era, you might feel different about the Cubs era. But in the Reds era, like, we'd have a, we'd have a couple of decent teams. But we just didn't ha- – like – we didn't have the guns for the postseason because everything shrinks like the aggregate in the regular season is different because everybody's going on five man rotations, but then you get into the the postseason and you're bringing your best guys in a shorter frame. I just think that's, I don't think Dusty's ever necessarily had the same caliber teams, but you know, it is what it is. He's Mr. Regular season. (laughs) Maybe next year though. He's like, if he, if, if he stays with the Astros, yeah. I mean, he's like 97 years old, so like yeah. I don't know how long he can continue to manage. <laughs> but like you know, they've got it. If Verlander comes back and he can still throw at however old he is after Tommy John, maybe he gets one more crack at it. Well, you know, in Dusty's defense this year, who thought that that the Astros were going to be in the ALCS? I didn't think yeah. So. Yeah. I don't know any prognosticator that picked the Astros to be there. And uh, this, the next game we're going to talk about, actually, is a, is a perfect example. They used five rookie pitchers, DJ, in game five. Five rookie pitchers. Um, and so I, I think Dusty Baker is a great manager. Yeah, that's a great point, Brad. I mean, there's a lot of great teams. Uh, I mean, we all knew those Cubs weren't as good as the Marlins. I mean, it was obvious, right? <laughs> Don't even start. <laughs> <laughs> Those Marlins are clearly great teams because when they fielded the the next league's championships by farming off all their players, all those other teams were great. Yeah. <laughs> Worked out well for the Yankees. Oh, the yeah. Marlins were like the Yankees farm system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, back to game five. Four to three Astros, walk-off home run by Carlos Correa. Uh, a Rosarena, of course, homered again. Uh, Choi homered. Uh, Brandon Lau, who was missing most of the postseason, uh, Homer, and I think last I saw he was hitting about 118 for the postseason. So I don't know what's going on with him, but uh, you know, not not a good postseason for him. And that brings you to game six. Uh, 7-4 win by the Strokes. Framber Valdez once again is the man. Six innings, nine Ks. Presley saves, uh, gets his second saves of the World Series. Kyle Tucker, Homers, along with and, uh, Springer and Correa had RBIs. And then there's game seven, and uh, the Rays ran out Charlie Morton, pretty clutch. Uh, he pitches five and two-thirds great innings, strikes out six. Rosarena and uh, Zunino provide the offense, both with two-run homers, four to two Rays. They're heading to the World Series. And, guys, uh, I, I really believe 
that the reason the Rays won this year, the reason they're so good, it's just depth, man. Their bullpen, as Kevin Cash said, they got a stable of guys that throw 98. And when you can just mix and match those guys that way, I mean, it's unbelievable. And even like the guys they pinch hit, I've never heard of most of them. But they come in, they do their job, great job by Kevin Cash and the organization putting together a team like that. And uh, I hate to say it, but I'm kind of pulling for them a little bit, DJ. Yeah, I know you are. And let me say, let me add to that a little bit. Austin Meadows disappeared this year after a very awesome season last year. He did not do anything. He hasn't done anything in the playoffs. He's actually even been sitting a lot, which is crazy to think. A guy that had, had 90 to 100 ribbies last year has a very low uh, part of this team. Like you said, Lau hasn't hit, but they're so deep, Brad. Like, this team is just so deep, and it's unbelievable – and uh, in our in our postseason uh, picks here after the season was over, you know, I thought Kevin Cash deserves a manager of the year. That guy's unbelievable. You know, and he, I can't remember what game it was, but he took Snell uh, out of the game at about, you know, 70 pitches. He just took him out, went to that bullpen. And, you know, you guys know Blake Snell doesn't – that doesn't sit well with him, man. And, and most starters, it really doesn't. But Blake Snell is considered kind of their ace guy. You know, he's one – they got – you know, they got three of them pretty much. But he's one of those guys. And – Man, it takes a lot to go out there and get that guy. You know he doesn't want you to take the ball from him. That's hard to do because you know that if the relievers give up those runs, you look like a complete idiot. So mm -hmm. it was it was really – I mean, it worked out for him. You know, tip your cap to him. And a lot of this has to do with handling the bullpens, man. It really does. I, I say it till I'm blue in the face. But, Brad, man, you have to be able to manage your pitching in the playoffs. And the ones who do it the best are going to win the World Series. A hundred percent. And somehow or another, even in the National League series, Davey Roberts pulled it off to where when they got to game seven, uh, there's a couple of times he probably realized we're not winning this game and just and just trusted that his team could win. I think the same thing with the Rays. Like they didn't panic. And that's why you pull a guy like that. When you got that many studs, you're just not worried. You can just keep firing them in there. And it gives you a real advantage when the batter doesn't get a chance to see the same guy twice. When they've got to see a different stud every time, it's, uh, it's almost like uh, seeing an all-star lineup. Right. But we got to talk about this kid of Rosarina, though. Like, yeah. I, I, he doesn't have the, the at-bats yet. He's, he's still technically a rookie. But about 60 games in, including this postseason, I looked at the stats today, his OPS – is higher than Babe Ruth's, Barry Bonds, Lou Gehrig's, and Ted Williams. Wow. Jeez. You know what's crazy is the Cardinals traded him. That's what blows my mind. Uh, it just shows how good the Rays scouting is. Uh, yeah. You know, they, they really didn't give much, you know, to, uh, to get him either. Um, so, it's just amazing. I heard uh, somebody on MLB, I think, say that uh, he's the next Mookie Betts. And, uh, I mean, just – Unreal, man. I can't. I had. I had it here somewhere. How many home runs he had in the postseason? It was something crazy, man. Like eleven, I think maybe, or I, I can't remember exactly. Yeah, it's it's way up there. He owned the Yankees. I was just. I was dying inside every time they were pitching to him because you knew he was going to do something. Even his outs were just lasers, man. So it'll be interesting to see if the scouts can catch up, find that spot that he can't hit, that pitch he can't hit, or if he's just really that good. So yeah, like right now he is. Man, and this team's got three stud aces. You know, Yarbrough as the four guy is not bad at all either. You know, because they're only going four deep now. You, you want your fifth starter is irrelevant now. He'll be your bullpen guy. But, man, that Rays bullpen is ridiculous. They just got guy after guy after guy coming out there. And, man, if they let a, let a runner on or anything like that, he just yanks them and goes to the next one because – like you said, he's got a stable full man. <laughs> this team is legit. Like, yeah. yeah. And and they're beasts. I'm gonna let me read to yeah. you the the height of these guys. 6'10, 6'6, 6'5, 6'5, 6'5, 6'4, 6'6, 6'3. Like yeah. that's that's the height. Like those there's a reason those guys are throwing gas. And they're throwing <laughs> out Randy Johnson and like power forwards. Yeah. <laughs> Like, there's just something different when a guy is on the mound and he's 6'5 or 6'6. Six, six. Yeah. yeah, no doubt. Man, I like Glasnow, man. That, that Yankee series, it was just unbelie unbelievable to me how good he is. I mean, yeah. he's amazing, man. Triple digits, you know, even late in the game. And uh, he's painting corners. His curveball's sick. I mean, just nasty. 
uh, like you said, DJ, this, this team is really good. They're, they're going to be tough to beat. Yeah, absolutely they are. They're, gonna, they're absolutely loaded. So, I mean, anybody got anything else to add on the ALCS? <laughs> all good? All right. So, on I'm to the good. NLCS. Um, game one, uh, Atlanta gets a home run from MVP Freddie Freeman, who, uh, Brad, I don't know your thoughts on that. Do, what do you think as far as the MVP? You think it's Freddie? I think I think it's Freddie Freeman. I mean, the guy, not only did he put up the numbers, and I think when you look at his numbers versus the other two or three guys, like he is in every category. He's, he's in the top three or four spots in the National League, but he did it in clutch situations. Mm-hmm. Like there was rarely – I think in this past series he only – uh, struck out one time in kind of a clutch situation. He either sack flied, hit a home run, or hit a base hit, or drew a walk in every clutch situation. It was it was impressive. He it was like ice water in his veins. Yeah. Um, the I, the Braves probably don't get to Game Seven without without him because Acuna at the top was was nothing. I mean, he just he did not have a good series. Uh, and so Freddie, Freddie was essentially the leadoff hitter for the Braves this this series, and was, I think he's, I think he's incredible. Although I think his this son may become a better hitter than him. I love watching all the videos yeah. of his boy, like, oh, yeah. shooting yards. And so think about this: his boy, this quick little little uh, rabbit trail. Freddie's boy plays on a t-ball team with Dan Ugla's son and Ryan Howard's son. Oh <laughs> man, like. <laughs> Dude, I just want to go watch that T-ball team play this summer. Like, <laughs> let's watch Little Ryan Howard, Dan Ugla, and Freddie Freeman on the T-ball team. Oof. Wow. wow, talking about some ballers. Man, hey Brad, I gotta ask you something. You're a you're a dual Braves and Reds fan. We talked about this at length. How dumb of uh, how dumb was it of the Reds to pitch to Freddie Freeman with a base open in that game with the Reds? Well, I don't know what the analytics say, but for the last 100 years, you know, don't pitch to the best player in the league. No like, like, put him on the bases. Uh, it just you, – you knew it was going to happen. You knew it's going to come through. Like, he walked up. I, I knew where I was sitting. I was sitting on my back deck watching the game, and I said, well, this is – this is the game's over. Yep. They're pitching to Freddie, and he's going to – and he's going to just hit a flare and win. And they did I think everybody in the world knew what was going to happen right there, ex- except for uh, the Reds manager. Uh, it just – it still blows my mind to this day. I mean, it's a fireball fence. It has to be, right? I mean, you just can't do that. You just can't yeah. do it. Yeah, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. It was crazy, and I agree. David Bell, man, it would be interesting to see what they do with him. So, Freeman gets him right on to – right away home run, uh, and the Braves are rolling. Kike Hernandez ties in the bottom of the fifth with a solo homer. Austin Riley gets uh, Blake Trinan for a homer in the, in the ninth. Marcelo Zuna singles uh, to drive in Acuna. It's three to one. Then Ozzie Albies drives in a two-run shot to end it at five to one. Braves get in the game number one. Mookie and Cody Bellinger were 0 for four. The offense only got four hits that night. Max Freed showing why he's a Nev- uh, Cy Young candidate, man. He was dominant. Uh, six innings pitch, one earned run, nine Ks. Bueller only goes five innings, gives up one earned, seven Ks. He had a good outing, but five innings is a problem, guys. Uh, first goes back to what Jamie said last week, David, um, and I'd be like to pick your brain a little on this one, Brad. Um, these guys that are starters, a lot of these guys are going five or six, and they're getting mass money. And a lot of these guys, you know, like we're looking and seeing with the Rays and the and the Dodgers here, the both teams that are in the in the finals here rely a lot on their bullpen. So why are we paying starters eight yeah. hundred twenty five million? What do you think? Yeah, it that? is the, the game has changed so much, but I'll tell you why I'm surprised. I anticipated the playoffs this season being different than really any playoffs in the last twenty years. I thought with a third of a major league season being shaved off and the freshness of arms going into the postseason that there would be like a change in strategy that you and new guys would have more gas. They'd have more uh, endurance because they wouldn't have the tread of the whole season. They they're basically in all-star break mode right now, physically. 
And so I'm surprised uh, the way they were, the only exception being the concern over Bueller's blister thing. That makes sense trying to limit his innings. But other than that, the concern about, oh, he's got 25 pitches or 50 pitches. I'm like, these guys, like they've not even played a full season. I thought they would, they would really bump it up. But yeah, the, um, the, the change in baseball has even gotten more. It used to be like, you know, you'd have the old guys, Tom Seavers, Noah Ryans. They, they threw complete games all the time. But then it was like, try to get to the seventh inning. All right. And you, you hope to go, you know, a good outing was get seven innings, then go to your bullpen for eight and nine. But now it's like, man, if we can just get five good innings, I'm like, what? Yeah. Five good innings for $40 million. I'm with you. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know if it's a difference in um, offensive ability or scouting or if it's it, if it's actually the money's the problem because the investment's so high, you want to have them for a longer career and not, and not risk injury. I'm not, I'm not sure why, but I was surprised in this postseason with a light workload in the season that there's not been more uh, expected out of the starters. Yeah, that's a real good point. And, and, and we were talking about this too, is like, I, I really believe that it's going to be very, very rare, if not never happen again, where we see a 300-game winner because of all that again. So it be very interested to see if we can pull that off again. So game two, news breaks that Kershaw has a stiff back. Uh, so in steps Tony Gonsolin, um, who is horrible, gives up five runs and four and a third. Uh, they use seven pitchers that game, give up eight earned runs. Would have been nice to see David Price – out there, you know, stepping in in this situation. The long-lost Dodger who opted out, uh, that would have been a nice spot for him to step in and uh, and give his teammates a lift there in game two, but he wasn't there. So um, they struggled, and Seager was awesome. He had four ribbies in this game, two hits and a walk, and Freddie Freeman once again homers. Puts the Braves up 2-0. Uh, four run top of the fifth brings the score to 6 nothing. Top of the seventh, Swanson puts the Braves up 7 nothing. Finally, in the bottom of the seventh, Corey Seager hits a three-run bomb. Uh, Ozzy Albies then homers to make it eight to three. Going into the Dodgers, uh, bottom half of the ninth, they score four runs. They make this game really interesting. Seager doubles. Muncy hits a two-run homer, and Bellinger triples. And all of a sudden, it's eight-seven, guys. And uh, A.J. Pollock, ground ball. Uh, I think the exit velo on that one was 104 to the third baseman. So he just missed it because – he hit it right to him. If it was off to the side a little bit, going 104, probably would have got through. Would have been a tie game. Uh, anyways, what a game. They fall short. Uh, but, man, that was a tough one, Brad. I, what were you feeling on that one? Were you feeling a little scared during that game? Yeah, so I thought that was – I thought that game probably is the best synopsis of this matchup because uh, it other than the when the uh, Dodgers put up 15 in the middle of the series – you knew that any – like, no lead was big enough. Like, two-zip, three-one, that – it was not game over. These teams have so much offensive firepower that uh, when it was 8-3 in the, at the end, it was like, ah, we hope we get out. And once it was – once there was seven on the scoreboard, every Braves fan for the last 20 years knows how that game ends. And that ends with the Dodgers doing a walk-off. But Austin Riley snaps that ball at third base – then he almost throws Freddie off the base. So even the throw to first, <laughs> like, ah, okay, <laughs> Freddie got it. But uh, I thought that – I thought game two was that's the Dodgers. If we played another seven-game series, I think it would it would go just the way it did. They've just – they can just – they can just hit like no other two teams in the National League. So, David, what did you think about um, when you heard that Kershaw wasn't pitching? What was the first thing that came to your mind? And be honest with you, I thought the Dodgers were in some real trouble because that was really the one advantage that they – I felt like they held over the Braves is, you know, they had a little bit better rotation. Um, and so, yeah, I, I honestly thought thought that they could be cooked. And, guys, I was going to bring up something to you guys. How much different do you think this series is if the Braves have Soroka? That was a big deal, man. I know that, And yeah. I know the Dodgers didn't have Price, but Soroka was the ace, man. If you put Soroka and Freed back-to-back – and that, that's as good as anybody's one, too. I mean, what do you guys think? I mean, how big of an impact do you think that was? Well, most I, – I think the guys that they had did pretty well, all things considered. 
but typically in the in the league championship series, you don't send a guy out for his first career start. <laughs> Like the Braves are sending guys out for their first career postseason start and then first career start ever. And uh, nice. I think I think if you're the manager, you're going into that game and you've got this – you have to have this sophisticated game plan, whereas if you can send your ace out at, out there, you, you're you already – real. You're, it saves your bullpens, guys, for like those later series. So I thought, I thought that really hurt them in games – four, five, six, where the Dodgers obviously came back to beat them because they exhausted their bullpen guys early with their inexperienced staff. Right. So I think, David, like you were saying, is, is you know, not having Soroka was huge. That was a really big one. But even think about this a little bit, and it's not to a higher extent, but Cole Hamels didn't pitch either, you know, and Cole Hamels is a dog in the playoffs. You know, I don't know if he would be at this age, but, man, that you talk about a gamer and a guy that, you know, could at least maybe get you four or five, which stinks to, you know, that's kind of what we're trying to not really want. But even if they needed another five, lefty, uh, yeah, they did. They needed a lefty against that lineup. Yep. Because Corey Seager just smoked him. Yeah, he did. Hmm. So yep, you're right. So game three, guys. Um, that's the historic game where the Dodgers score eleven runs in the first inning, and you know what? Um, as awesome as that was to see, it kind of <laughs> – I think a lot of Braves fans checked out for the night after that inning, and I don't blame them. Oh, yeah. That game's over right away. I mean, there's no coming back from that. You get 11 runs in the first, there's no, there's yeah. like a 0.001 chance of coming back, and there's no way. So Yeah, I'm in a big cookout <laughs> with some families, and we've there's a big TV out on the – like where there's like at this pool house, and like we go in to get food. Like after the anthem and come back out, it's like <laughs> five zip. Somebody, somebody's messed up. Look, and like, no, no, it's really five zip. And then it's eleven zip, and we're like, all right, you guys can like watch a reality TV show or something. Like, who cares anymore? <laughs> let's just let's just eat and talk. It was crazy. <laughs> That'll change your plans, no doubt. That game was so fast. Um, so that broke a record of ten which was the Cardinals had to, obviously had that a couple of years ago against the Braves as well. So the Braves have gone through that before. Uh, the overall record is 18 by the Cubs uh, the, for runs in an inning, not in the postseason, but overall in the regular season, 18 runs by the Cubs in 1883 against the Tigers. I always wondered what the record for most runs in an inning was by a team since that happened in the postseason. It was 18. That's unbelievable. Oh. Kyle well, Wright, the previous question, if you have your ace, you might not give up 11 runs in that in that game. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a real good point because your three starters are a whole lot different there. And I'm just sitting – it was the same. Kyle Wright's ERA was 94.50 after that game. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> bad. Um, that's a good point, Brad, though. he He's not – you know, maybe he sneaks in game four if, if you know, they got the guys in there. 14 batters in the first inning, seven hits, three walks, one hit batter. Jock Edwin Homer, Muncie hits a grand slam. Julio Urias was awesome. Five innings pitched, one earned runs, five Ks. He only – he did throw 101 pitches in five innings, which is crazy. Uh, but he did, he did well, and he had a lot of cushion, so he could have done that. So, um, once again, you know, it just uh, – we may never, like I said, we may never see a 300 winner again because of that. So game four, Kershaw gets ready to go. Guys, he gave up one run through five innings. The Dodgers offense scores two runs. The game, they lose 10 to two. Braves win. All I see is that, you know, Kershaw is choking again, and he's got the whole, you know, everybody hates Kershaw in the playoffs. And But, man, come on. The Dodgers scored two runs to his defense. I know he fell apart a little bit there in the sixth. And, you know, maybe he got stuck with it a little bit too long there. But um, they did not give him any offense. He did not pitch that bad. Um, the Braves blew up for six runs in that sixth inning. Ended up being the route was on. Marcelo Zuna had two bombs, four ribbies. Uh, I just want to point out in the Braves preview, Brad, um, <laughs> David, David and Stephen Shelton both said that Will Smith was the biggest pickup of the Braves offseason. And I said Marcelo Zuna. And they both said Marcelo Zuno was going to have a terrible year. I just wanted to let you know that I got that one right. So. I appreciate it. <laughs> Dude, that guy made $18 million this year on his one-year contract. He just earned himself some serious cabbage. Like, he's getting 
a big contract because he was – he's the perfect guy to have behind Freddie. Uh, and that's probably why the Reds pitched to Freddie. I still would have pitched to Azunia. But, uh, like, he he could he, – I would like to see a speed gun on his bat swing. Like, that guy swings about 200 miles an hour. It's unbelievable how hard. And he makes good contact, too. He doesn't David, strike out a lot. That's good. Yeah, you're right. David, do you think that they're going to re-sign Norzuna? That's real interesting. You know, the Braves aren't really known for spending big money. But I'm not sure Ozuna's going to command big money. I know he had a big year, but, you know, he's kind of a negative in the outfield. Uh, of course, we know the National League DH is probably here to stay, so he could fit there. But how much money are you going to give – a 30-something year old DH. Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I, the best DH there is in the league is probably uh, Nelson Cruz. And I don't think he's making 18 million uh, this year. So it'll be interesting. It would just depend on the contract, I guess. And, you know, the Braves are in a different situation financially. They're deep. They, they need him or they need a guy like him. So if I'm the Braves, yeah, I'm, I'm spending the money. But like I said, that's not what they're really known for doing. So I want to point out, too, that Acuna fell on his wrist and act like he was out for the season. And then he <laughs> runs around the bases and was high-fiving everybody as hard as he possibly could. So I hate that LeBron James stuff. You can keep all that. NBA, he watched too much NBA. He needs to quit that stuff. So I'll move on to game five now. So Will Smith. That, that was such a, that was such a get-off-my-lawn Clint Eastwood old man moment right there. <laughs> hey, boy, I'm with you, DJ. <laughs> Come on, Acuna. Suck it up, dude. <laughs> Game five, Will Smith, the losing pitcher. Uh, David, they scored three in the sixth and three in the seventh to win seven to three. The Dodgers are coming back. Uh, Will Smith hits a three-run homer off of Will Smith. That's kind of cool. Pitcher so, first Will of all, Smith. listen to this guy. What's up? Pitcher Will Smith was lost. I yeah. Was lost that at bat, but he was not making good pitches. It was real obvious what was getting ready to happen, and I'm betting – after they saw him warm up, it was like, eh. you know, I wish we could pull him, but they couldn't. You know, got the three batter rule or whatever. Yeah. It was bad. Corey Seager has two bombs in this game. Um, Pache robbed uh, a home run in that game. This kid's, this kid's looking pretty good. I kind of like seeing him in the NLCS. Future's definitely bright for him, man. Uh, I thought he's, he did really well. You know, he didn't really hit the ball too well, but he showed a lot of promise. And, guys, so going back to Will Smith off of Will Smith, think about this for a second. <laughs> they said that that was the first time that this guys with the same names that faced each other in the postseason. Who does that stat? Like, could you, could you imagine <laughs> being the guy at the MLB stats and be like, hey, David, you got to go back to 1869 all the way until the present and see if anybody had the same name when they faced each other in the postseason. You got to go through every game, every box score. How do they know this stuff, man? It blows my mind how they can come up with some of these stats, man. Just unbelievable. I agree. So, game six, the Dodgers win three to one. Great action game. Mookie Betts with an awesome catch to save a run. Uh, Walker Buehler dominates. He was absolutely awesome. Kenley uh, comes in and does well at the end. All three runs scored in the first inning for the Dodgers. It was vital the Dodgers get off to a great start. Seeger and Turner go back to back off Freed in the first. They kind of took the sales out when they got three runs off free in the first inning. Cody Bellinger singers to score, uh, singles to score Will Smith. Bueller goes six innings, which is good for him recently. We had talked about him only going four and five. So six was good to get out of him. He gave up seven hits, but no runs, six Ks. Braves had the bases loaded, nobody out. Bueller had a K, a K, and a ground out, got out of that. I think that cost the Braves the game there. Uh, Bueller was awesome. Acuna had the lone RBI for the Braves. And then, Brad, we get into game seven, man. Um, I do feel for you, man. I really do. I know this was uh, really hard to take, I'm sure, as a Braves fan. But what a game, man. The Braves jump out to a 2-0 lead. Will Smith, two-run single, ties it. It's 2-2. Two two. Uh, Riley gives the Braves a 3-2 lead in the bottom of the sixth. Kike Hernandez, guys, pinch hits for Jock Peterson. It's a bomb. And so who's the first guy out of the dugout to congratulate Kike? It's Jock Peterson. I'm telling you, man, that shows good team, you know, being a good teammate it's all about, you know, because they're facing the lefty there. He went to Kike, made a great managerial move, and Jock Peterson's there supporting his teammate, which was really cool to see. Um, Roberts let him go back out for the ninth. Julio with a 4-3 lead. 
uh, pretty awesome after Bellinger hit the massive homer in the seventh. Uh, I thought the key moment was to keep Urias in the game there in the ninth and not go to Kenley. I was screaming that, keep him in the game. He's mowing him down. And it ended up being a great call by Roberts. Uh, Corey Seager, guys, was the MVP. Five bombs, 11 ribbies in this series. I believe 11 ribbies is a postseason single season, uh, single series uh, record for RBI in the series. So I think the home run, the five home runs is too. Crazy, man. It's crazy. So, Brad, what was your overall? So, first of all, game, game seven, anybody who's followed the Braves, like once they lost game six, they knew they lost game seven. Like, you just you just assumed it. You got twenty years of that's that's the that's the way it goes for the Braves. But two two things. Uh Corey Seager obviously was the MVP of the series. Uh he lifted the Dodgers, especially in those last couple of games. But Kiki Hernandez uh got some big hits. Uh was was one of the, some of the runs getting scored there, but I was saying sarcastically to somebody the other day, he's played, he played a great short right field versus the Braves. Yeah. And the inability for the young Braves to make any adjustments and not be able to hit out of the shift uh, cost them big time. Uh, uh, other than early in the series, Acuna and Albies were almost neutralized. Um, and uh, I, th- so I think Kiki Hernandez is kind of the unheralded – hero there he had a good glove and he was on base and uh he's a big factor in a bunch of uh seekers rbis kk our boy Kike. brian howard called that too beginning yeah. of the year, and he was big on some kike so uh that 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 turned out to be true yeah kike uh i don't know if you guys saw when bellinger hit the bomb in the seventh he came in and did the elbow thing with kike and Bellinger's shoulder actually came out of place. Yeah. yeah. And get put back in. I'm like, you guys yeah. cannot be hitting elbows, man. Ow. Yeah. I wonder – I think it was his right arm, so I'm, I'd be interested yeah. to see if that affects him at all in this next series. It, it will. He's definitely sore today, I promise you that, but it'll be interesting to see. So, Dave, do you got anything to add about that Dodger series? Uh, great series. I, I kind of hated it, to be honest with you. I really liked the Braves all year. Um, but the future's bright for the Braves, man. They're just – a piece or two they're young they're, yeah they're so young they're so loaded they're deep I don't know how much of that bullpen they get back but great bullpen um I feel like they're just a starter or two away um I feel like I, jo- I hope Josh Hill is watching this I want to say this out loud I feel like Brian Snitker did a pretty good job uh this season with yeah. everything he was dealt man I didn't think there's any way the Braves were going to get here when, the, when their pitching started to go down but man hats off to them uh, great season Yep, so that was a really cool series. And so, guys, we'll transition here real quick. And there's a four MLB players from the past that passed away this week. Uh, I think, guys, I saw 53 guys have passed away that are former major leaguers. Uh, and the number of major leaguers total that have ever played in the game is 19,903. That's crazy to think it's only that much. You would think that it's way more than that. But 19,000 guys have played this game, and, and it's – uh. It's been, a, it's been a tough year. So a couple guys real quick, we just kind of want to give them a little love because when they pass away, you kind of look at their career a little bit more and look at a little in-depth them and get to kind of see some cool stories. So I just got a couple guys here. I'll take about three or four minutes here to go over real quick. So Jay Porter was a catcher uh, called up in 1952 by the St. Louis Browns. 1953, 1954, he served in the military, Terry, uh, came back in 57 to 50. Uh, 55 to 57 with the Tigers. In 1959, he ended his career with the Washington Senators. Um, he's His number one similarity score, David, this is crazy. You know, when you go on Baseball Reference and check him out, Kim Batiste, the guy that you're talking about here. In a few oh, minutes. Wow. Isn't that crazy? That's just unbelievable to think that those two guys that passed away this week are the same guy, basically. So that was cool to see. Uh, he only had eight home runs and 62 RBI in his career. Let's not – you know, sugarcoat that. Uh, but the fact is he made it to the show. His best year was in 1957 with uh, the Tigers. He batted 250, two bombs, 18 ribbies. In 1951, a scout went to see him play and discovered Frank Robinson as well, which is really cool, man. Uh, he signed them both on the same day and actually gave Porter more money than Robinson, which is really cool. The cool story. Um, 
His favorite meal was two dozen eggs at one time. He would challenge the world champion for an eating contest in one sitting, but the guy never showed up. So <laughs> kind of crazy. Um, David and Brad, this is, <laughs> is kind of a question I had for you. So if there was one food that you would enter an eating contest for, what would it be? Brad, go first. Uh, Krispy Kreme donuts. I could, I could probably win hot and ready, hot with the light on. Like when I was young, I, I just eat a whole box by myself. Actually, recently I've done it. <laughs> what about you, David? DJ, I can dominate some pizza. Like, yeah. I can dominate some pizza. Papa John's, you give me Papa John's, you give me a little bit of that butter to let it slide down. I can <laughs> Pizza. I'd have to go Papa John's pizza. What so about I you? Actually, I actually, um, I was in an eating contest once at a minor league hockey game here. <laughs> it's my brother-in-law, and we ate uh, potatoes against each other, and oh. I almost threw up. It was that bad. <laughs> so bad. Um, no, I don't know, man. I, those are two good answers. I have I have no idea. I I just see myself no matter what it is, even if it's something that I love, I I would throw up. There's there's no doubt whatsoever yeah. I'd be done. Like there's very few things qu that make you want to vomit as much as watching the hot dog deal on July Fourth. And they're like, <laughs> do it. Like they've got like a hundred. I'm like, how is he not have? How is he not dead? Like how do you even live beyond that? <laughs> hey, I gotta ask you guys some regarding Papa John's. How many of you guys? You know, we were all broke college students at one point. We're sitting down in the lobby with bated breath, hoping Boyce McKelvin would walk in. Dude. With those leftover pieces. Dude. Yeah. I'm, I married a woman for that girl's. And, like, our date was, like, to go to the LRC with a $5 Papa John's pizza. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. Those are the days, man. I used to, I used to couldn't wait till Boyce got back and just prayed that he had a pizza with him. So, so Porter makes his debut in 1952 with the Browns. <clears throat> and the very next day, guys, after his major league debut in 1952, both his dad and his wife tragically die in a car crash. So can oh, you imagine oh, wow. you make your MLB debut and the next day is the worst day of your life from the best day to the worst day? What a nightmare, obviously. So sad to read that. Um, <clears throat> just crazy. And uh, he, he was asked one time, what's the most important skill that a catcher should have? He said, get to know your pitcher well enough so that he seldom shakes you off. The best pitcher I ever caught was Warren Spahn, and he never shook me off. So rest wow. in peace, Jay Porter. Uh, what a great – you know, that was a lot of fun to read about that. Um, my second guy real quick, Fred Wenz, uh, passed away. Righty pitcher, career 3-0 and record. I guess he always could say that he made it to the majors. You know, some of these guys just get a cup of coffee, man. And, and I, I think all of us would die just to have that, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, he played 1968 and 69 for the Red Sox and 70 for the Phillies. 31 career games as a reliever. Never got a start. Uh, nine years in the minors and finally got called up. So good for him in 1968. After his first appearance, um, a doctor gave him a cortisone shot because his arm was hurting. And it punctured a blood vessel. Uh, that created clotting in his arm and he's I guess back then he's lucky he survived that so he just makes it to the show and something bad happens to him as well uh, he always regretted Dick Williams the manager of the Padres in the 84 World Series he he blames him for ruining his career which is kind of kind of cool to read I, I mean not cool but kind of crazy he just he just said that he kept taking him down to the minors and bringing him back and it just messed with him mentally so he never really could get going in his career and only played three short innings um, so he kind of regrets Dick Williams being a part of his career. Um, called him out in his retirement speech too, which is kind of crazy, but oh, yep. Wow. So rest in peace, Fred Wins. Dave, you got two guys for us? Yep. Uh, let's see here. Give me just a second. I got Kim Batiste. Uh, he was drafted in the third round in 1987. Um, his claim to fame, he played from 91 to 95. His claim to fame was he had a game winning hit actually against the Braves in the 93 NLCS. Um, his best year was a 93, hit 282 uh, with five homers. Um, he played shortstop and third, um, but not a long career, um, kind of up and down. Most of his career, that 93 season, he was up quite a bit. Um, 
but, you know, a great career. To, to say you played in the World Series, had a game-winning hit. Uh, he also had a game-losing error in game one of that same series. Wow. Um, so, uh, but rest in peace to him. Uh, good career, like you said. Anybody would love to be up any amount of time to be able to play in a World Series, man. That's a, that's a big deal. And, DJ, I'm going to be honest with you. I do not have the first name of my next guy here, Paranoski. Um, Ron. Ron Paranoski, man, great career. Played from 61 to 73. He was uh, before his time, really. Uh, he was a reliever uh, back when relievers weren't cool. Uh, he led the, the league in saves twice, had 178 career saves, a career 279 ERA. Uh, played in four World Series. He actually was fourth in MVP boat, voting in his best season, which was in 63. Um, 18 career war, DJ. I know, know you love those, uh, those analytics or whatever. Um, but he also was a pitching coach for the Dodgers and the Giants. Um, and, you know, just a great career. He went 16-3 and in that 63 season with a 167 ERA. So wow. um, definitely a stud, definitely before his time. This is back when relievers went multiple innings. Um, so he would pitch in 70 games and, and have a ton, ton of innings as well. So great career, not only as a player, but also as a uh, coach and a manager. I think he was in the Giants organization when they won the World Series for the first time there in 2004, I believe it was. Um, so, no, it wouldn't have been four. That would have been a Red Sox. But, anyway, uh, he, was, he was part of that uh, organization at that point. So, great career by him. Yes, sir. So, tough to hear all four of those guys going this week. It's, it's been a rough year for, for um, former major leaguers passing away. So, Brad will transition now. So, uh, Brad, give us a little uh, – little spiel about your high school career, uh, transition to Temple when you came along here. Uh, tell us your story about what happened at Temple and just give us an overall uh, career. Uh, yeah. You. Well, I, uh, I was that kid who was overly intense about baseball. I was telling somebody the other day that, like when I, you know, coach pitch, like when a kid next to me would be playing the dirt, like I'd be yelling at him, like, get baseball ready. Like, come on, like, stop playing in the dirt. So I just loved it. Um, uh, played with one of your Temple teammates in high school, Jason Stiltner. We were on the same team. And we were a really good baseball. His senior year, my sophomore year, we, we finished third in the state. We were this, uh, you know, it's like almost like a story this from this tiny town we didn't even have a grass infield like we were we were just like country boys and we had a coach who was so disciplined and taught us so much uh we averaged less than two errors in high school per game that season and so we were really good in the field uh you guys remember Jason Stiltner Jason is just like he is a country boy he's like cuts trees to this day I'll never forget it Jason his senior year uh, stopped using traditional batting gloves and had like woodworking leather gloves, like, like the kind that you get at Home Depot. And he had like 10 home runs and batted 400 with like chainsaw gloves. Yes. Uh, it was awesome. That is awesome. Best moment of my high school career had nothing to do with me winning a game. We're playing Megs County though. And we're really good, but we have an off day for some reason. And Megs is up on his big. And they had a couple of guys that played on their football team. And they started tra talking trash to us. So we had a guy on our team who we actually played against when we played around state during the fall one year, Adam Dyer. Adam uh, kind of got revenge on their trash talk and brought one one up and high and hit one of their guys. And so this guy's like got a Division One college football scholarship. And he starts charging the mound on Adam. And Adam could have been a comedian. He could have been like on Jimmy Fallon. Adam throws his glove off and gets in the karate kid stance. <laughs> and like nobody knows what to do. He's standing in the Ralph Macchio karate kid stance in a high school game where the guy charged the mound and everybody just freezes. It made the newspaper. It was that amazing. That's awesome. So we, uh, we have a great – my sophomore year is uh, – we were pretty good. We, we finished third in the state of Tennessee that year. We lost to Brentwood Academy uh, down to the state championship back when the private schools could have, like, eight kids from out of state on their teams. Um, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Junior, senior year, not, not as great. My, it was really tough. I went from third in the state my sophomore year to um, what we won four games my senior year. Mm. Like we just lost so many players. Uh, my, I was, I transitioned from shortstop to catcher my senior year because I was the only guy who could catch our two pitchers. My brother threw about 92, and so I was the only guy who could catch him. Uh, and he went on to play for Walter State. Uh, and so for those who are familiar with community college baseball, Walter State's like one of the preeminent uh, JUCO programs. But uh, from there, uh, I, I kind of kind of knew – kind of my track what I wanted to do early on and it was ministry and um my mom and I, I knew some people had went to the temple and uh Jason was there and we played baseball and so went down and uh had a lot of fun that fall year and probably imagined myself playing the whole time we were down there but something um I started getting all sorts of opportunities to do stuff outside of baseball that I didn't, ex didn't expect. And so um, there's probably two factors, probably losing four games my senior year and playing a ton of baseball and not really getting over ever, ever being that unsuccessful. Uh, and then just found some stuff that I really enjoy doing some speaking engagements I got to do on weekends and travel. And it was just going to be hard to do both. And um, I've just always been somebody, if I couldn't do something and give it my all, it, uh, I just couldn't be in. So I retired from the baseball team and ended up being the graduate assistant basketball coach for our women's basketball team for the rest of my yes. days, but then yes. cheered you guys on. But uh, one of the things I always like to tell people about my brief stint in college baseball is the privilege we got to at the time to play on and hit in the batter's box uh, of one of, at that time, only three remaining fields that Babe Ruth had played on. Mm -hmm. And so now there's only two. So good old Ingle Stadium. Yeah, that was a premier place to play. I, I, I was like you, man. I, I couldn't believe the first time we got to play there. It was just unreal standing on that mound, which was absolutely perfectly groomed, you know, just in, in great shape. And uh, I think about that all the time, to be honest with you, how lucky we were. You know, the last yeah. couple of years we were there, it went downhill a little bit. Uh, but even then, it was nicer than most other people's field that we played yeah. on it. And when I was in high school, that's where we played the state championships at, too, oh, was wow. there. And I always remembered, like, that center field was, like, the biggest center field I could ever imagine. Like, it was just so, so huge. I was like, man, who can actually hit the ball out at center? You have to be a beast. Yeah. I had a lot of ground to cover, man. That was a lot. That was Dude, a that, huge field. That was a lot of work for the center fielder. Yeah. So I just want to show this real quick. This I don't know if anybody can see this, but this is our picture here, man. This is this is the two. Th this is the fall of '99 right here. Uh, look at this, these guys. I know Brad, you're in the middle there. I see David over there with no hat. Uh, I'm over there in the middle between Howard and Morgan there. Um, this is this is a legendary picture, man. It's one of my favorites, to be honest with you. Uh, that was a lot of fun, and like you said, man, Ingle Stadium is one of the reasons I went to Temple. I'm not gonna lie to you. Like when they were calling and talking to me recruit me you know I had I had opportunities to go to a few different schools and um I saw that I'm like this is our home field and they're like yeah and I was like wow so I immediately was intrigued by that and it, it was a big factor in in bringing me along so yeah that's really cool man uh you got to play with Stiltner we talked to him a couple weeks ago and what a bulldog man he was he was just like you said uh that guy could pitch he could hit he just was all around great player and that had to be a lot of fun with having two you know, you and you and Stiltner obviously on the same team was was a there's a reason why you guys got third that year. So that's really cool, man. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Hey Brad, can you confirm that Jason Stiltner has calf implants? Dude. Uh, <laughs> like somebody was commenting about mine the other day and not even compare to his. Like I don't know if he like like somebody like he went to and got like a calf machine and put it in his basement or what? But there's something alien esque about. They're bigger than our thighs. I remember standing behind him. I told this story <laughs> but when when he was on here, maybe the, the episode after it. But I remember standing behind him when I first showed up at Temple. He's on the mound, you know, practicing or whatever. <laughs> just thinking, is there something in his socks? <laughs> like, what is going on with those calves, man? They were just ginormous. Like you said, they're as big as my thighs. 
It was. It was. And like, he knew it. Like he was. He was proud of him. Oh yeah, he, he still is. Proud of him. Yeah, he still it's is. a big deal. It's a big deal. I'm pretty sure he's doing calf exercises right now. <laughs> definitely got those strength shoes. You know, those shoes that have platforms on them. Yeah. I think Jason like yeah. works in those. But Jason was like, he's just a unique guy. Like, there's just – he lives in his own universe. Like I said, have you ever seen anybody use chainsaw gloves as batting gloves? No, but he did, and he hit 10 home runs. And he could th- – his his fastball was good, but his curveball was wicked. It just had such hard break. Yeah. It was hard to hit. Brad, were you the shortstop on that third-place team? I uh, I played second. Cool. That's awesome, man. I had to be – an unbelievable experience. You know, I, I never got to go that far. You know, I, we made it pretty far in the sectional when I was in high school. You know, the only time I ever experienced getting third place uh, was a, as a coach uh, in 2014. But as a player, man, that had to be had to be completely awesome. And like I said, you could yeah. you tell at Angle, like they have the state championships on the wall. We would put that up there for you guys, you know, when uh, when you guys would come and play the finals there. So that's really cool, man. It just – Yeah, it's special. I, stadium to play in the I still have the uh, – we, at the, we got little uh, balls, and all the team guys signed it, and we've got a plaque, and that's that's in my office. Um, so, I mean, it's, well, you know, that's 1996 or 7, whatever, however long it was ago, and it's, it's, it's still pretty special. Very cool, man. Well, um, we'll transition now. So, I got a trivia question for both of you real quick. I don't know if you guys came up with one or not, but I'll start. So, I want to know what player – Holds the record for the most World Series home runs. We're about to transition. Go ahead and go, because I know the answer. <laughs> I'll give most. you options. I'll give you options, Brad. Okay. Most home runs in the World Series. Who is the record holder for that? Is it Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, or Mickey Mantle? Man, Mickey Mantle played a lot of World Series match us but so did Ruth in the 20s I'm gonna go with Mickey Mantle I'm not sure which one oh boy number seven you're on it you got it David that your call too oh yeah yeah you're right good job Brad that's pretty good man nice very job. good <laughs> yeah I mean when you play in that many world series you get a good opportunity to hit a lot of home runs oh yeah that's a good I've, call, I've, I've got a trivia question for you two guys and Bring it involves it. the Brooklyn Dodgers and New York Yankees of 1955. So uh, here's a plug for a classic baseball book. This summer, I read The Boys of Summer, which is the story of the Brooklyn Dodgers when Jackie Robinson breaks into the league, breaks the color barrier, and the kind of the 1950s Brooklyn Dodgers and their life afterward. it. It's an incredible baseball book. Also history. It's especially moving just to know like the hell on earth that Jackie Robinson went through to just show up and play baseball. It's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. The Brooklyn Dodgers only won one World Series in Brooklyn. It was in 1955 to play in the Yankees. And the Brooklyn Dodgers had two Hall of Famers on their roster that did not play in that World Series. Two Hall of Famers that were on the Dodgers rosters but did not play. They got rings but did not play in the 1955 World Series. Really? Okay, so when you think of those team, that team, I think I'll, I'll give you one hit. Both of them were pitchers. Oh well, that throws me completely. In yeah, I was going to throw me off the scent too. I was thinking of a couple guys that I knew they were Hall of Famers, but they were position players. I was going Gil. I was going to go Gil Hodges, Pee Wee, and Jackie uh, Robinson. I was going to go that route, but if you say they're pitchers. The first he was ones, Jackie both played. The first ones that come to mind are Drysdale and Koufax, obviously. Koufax is one of them. Okay. Mm. Koufax didn't pitch in that series? He did not. That was like his rookie or second year, and he never got into the to the action. All right, the 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 next guy, you're just not gonna guess it, but you're gonna be like, oh my goodness, because he's one of the most famous Dodgers of all time. Tommy Lasorda. Oh, wow. Was, was a, he pitched two years in the big leagues. He only had a, a small short stint with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and he was back in the minors. As a matter of fact, Tommy Lasorda would joke later on that uh, Sandy Koufax kept him off the Dodgers Rogers because they eventually went with Sandy instead of him, which turned out to be a pretty good choice. 
<laughs> That's but Tommy, awesome. Tommy Lasorda went into the Hall of Fame as a manager with the Dodgers, and obviously Koufax is one of the great pitchers of all time. Both of them were on the, the in the World Series in that 55 team, but did not play. Wow. That's awesome. That's really, that's a really cool story. I had no idea Lasorda was on that team. Very cool. I had no idea Lasorda was a pitcher, just to be honest with you. That didn't strike you as a pitcher's body. <laughs> no. But that's, Especially that's when the bat's getting thrown at him at third base. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm going to throw you guys one here, and you, you'll probably get this, but we talked about Carlos Correa hit a walk-off. There's been two walk-off home runs in the history of the World Series. Who hit them? Ooh. One wow. in our era and one before. Oh, uh, was Kurt Bill Gibson uh, – was that a walk-off in the World Series for the Dodgers? Sure was. Yeah. The other one is Bill Mazeroski. Bill Mazeroski. Wow. Yeah, 1960, Pirates over the Yankees. Kurt Gibson's – he did have a walk-off. I should have prefaced this by game seven walk off. Game seven, yeah, because oh, that was like game seven. six. That was game six, wasn't it? I think that was, that was like one. his only at bat, too, or game one. Yep. You're right, though. That was his only at bat. And he came limping off there. And, okay, so it's definitely Mazeroski because that was game seven. So I'm going with that. Was it Kirby Puckett? Did Kirby Puckett walk off against the Braves? That was game six. Good call, though. That was game six. So good. Man, that's a good one. Walk off homer in game seven. I mean, Correa walked off last year, but was it game seven? Mm -mm. You, give, you guys give up? I give up. I mean, I feel like I've gave three guesses. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't you're know. Honest, you're, you, you got more walk offs than I would have guessed, just to be honest with you. It's Joe Carter. Oh, Joe Carter, yes. yeah. He throws the helmet off. Yes. And goes, yeah. For the Jays, yeah. Uh, 1993. Williams. 1993. Yes. That's exactly right, yep. Mitch Williams. Oh, man, I forgot about that one. That was a great, great series. Very good. Cool. It was. All right, so, Brad, I just wanted to transition here to our picks for the World Series here. We'll do a little little spiel on the a preview for the World Series here real quick, and we'll be done. <laughs> um, I'm 11-3 and three this postseason in my picks, Brad, and David's 8-6, and six, so – Mm, you're dominating. Just, just telling you, buddy. I, I mean, I hate to keep pointing these, this stuff out throughout the show, but it's, it's just facts. But, but are you funny. the Dusty Baker of the pick? <laughs> are you going to flame out in the end? Um, <laughs> see, I got a feeling. I got a feeling, Brad, he's going with the Rays in this series. So. I have to because you're going with the Dodgers. I'm yeah. just going to go and just say that. Just like the last series, I went ahead and picked the, the Braves – over the Dodgers. I thought that was going to happen. I was so pumped. Uh, but, yeah, of course I'm going with the race. Brad, who are you going with? Well, I'll give you one little tidbit, then I'll tell you who I'm going to go with. Most people probably view the Dodgers the way they view the Yankees as a team who bought all their talent. But the Dodgers actually have more – significantly more homegrown talent on their roster than the Rays do. Uh, I, think, I think they have 14 – players that they drafted and brought up in their system to the Dodgers nine. And uh, I think the, the Dodgers have been a loaded franchise that has not got over the precipice and you don't come back from three, one against the Braves if it's not your destiny. And I think the Dodgers get it done this year. Clayton Kershaw is probably the, Best pitcher. He's definitely the best pitcher of our generation, in my opinion. Probably on the Mount Rushmore of pitchers. Like, the guy needs to win one World Series, and he's going to start game one because of how the uh, scheduling went. And I think he's going to I think he's going to get a World Series win, and the Dodgers will bring it home in six. Mm, okay. So, I – that's a good call. I am going to th – I'm going to go seven, Dodgers. David, what do you – how many games do you think it's going? Yeah, I think this is going to be an epic series, to be honest with you. I think these are two the two deepest teams in the entire league. It, you know, a lot of times this doesn't work out this way. A, a team will get hot and they'll get in the series. Well, I think it did work out. These are the two best teams. I think this is going to be a seven-game series. And uh, like I said, I'm going, to, I'm going to throw it to the race. So, guys, um, World Series titles, Rays 0, Dodgers 6, 1955, 59, 63, 65, 
and the two in our lifetimes, 81 and 88. Uh, AL pennants, uh, one for the Rays, National League pennants, 25 for the Dodgers. East titles for the Rays, three. West titles for the Dodgers, 19. Wild card bursts for the Rays, three, two for the Dodgers. Uh, obviously, the Dodgers have just been around way much longer, so that's kind of the reason why they're so much farther ahead of them and all those. But uh, just cool to see those stats. All these games, guys, Tuesday, Wednesday, We'll get a break Thursday. We'll go Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We'll get a break Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So it's going to be like they're traveling in the same spot, obviously. Mm -hmm. but I think that those two off days are huge in this series. Um, it's good. You know, it was a lot of fun to see the sprint in the seven games. But you really like to see a day off or two here in the World Series just to kind of give everybody a chance to regroup a little yeah. bit, let the pitching settle in. Every game is uh, at 8 o'clock Eastern. Unfortunately, we have to listen to Joe Buck the whole time uh, on Fox, like always. Um, but what do you guys think about that extra two days off? In this Unless game? one of the games is on Sunday. We get, you didn't get Joe Buck for game seven because he was calling football. So maybe you get one ah. game. Good point. Good point. What do you think, David, about that? About the break in the World Series two games? You know, I, don't mind this, I don't mind not having the break, just to be honest with you. I kind of I like it. Yeah. Uh, I think it does probably give the Dodgers a little bit of an advantage maybe. I think the Dodgers are probably just a little bit better in their starting pitching. And, uh, you know, it may help them keep their uh, relief arms a little more rested to kind of keep up with the race. But I actually don't mind the, the, the seven straight games. So, guys, uh, if you had to go with the rotations, who would you give the advantage to? The Rays have Blake Snell. Charlie Morton, Tyler Glasnow, and Ryan Yarbrough. The Dodgers are going to go, not in this order, but Bueller, Kershaw, Urias, and May. Brad, who has the advantage of starting pitching? The way the schedule has fell, I think maybe for youth, uh, you would give it to the Rays, but I think uh, arrested Kershaw in game one means that the Dodgers get to use their ace in the middle of the series. And because of the rest, get to use them again. So I think they get to use their ace for the last decade and their current ace twice. And to me, that gives them an opportunity to win four games and win the series. That's a good point. I heard something today about them possibly holding Bueller back until game three so they can use them again in seven if needed. Um, it just kind of sets up that way to where it would work. So, David, what do you think? I would give the Dodgers a, a slight advantage. Um, I like Tyler Glass now. I think he's nasty, but he also has a tendency to give up some runs. Um, I, I'm not a huge believer in Snell. Um, I just personally don't like him, just to be honest with you. Uh, and so if I'm, if I'm saying those are the top two stars, I'm going to give the Dodgers the advantage in both those situations. Morton is probably a little ahead of uh, the Dodgers' third starter, uh, and I'm probably going to put May ahead of Yarborough. So I'm, I'm going to give a slight advantage to the Dodgers. Me as well, just slightly, though. That's a that's a tough one. So, the, the bullpens, Ryan Thompson, Nick Anderson, Diego Castillo, Peter Fairbanks, Josh Fleming, and John Curtis. For the Rays, for the Dodgers, Tony Gonsolin, Kenley Jansen, Blake Trinan, Pedro Baez, Jake McGee, Joe Kelly, Bruce Starr, Gratterall, uh, Gonzalez, Alex Wood. What do you think bullpen-wise, Brad? I think the best thing that happened to the Dodgers – is Jansen got some confidence back. He came in, had that three-pitch inning or three-out inning, and uh, I think that probably makes him going into the World Series feeling good about himself. There was there was even like – even his coaches were saying, well, we don't really have the closer solidified. And so I think that really helps them that they showed that they had a couple of guys who could lock down uh, the first or second best offense in the NL. And so that puts them in a pretty good place. David? I like the Rays better just because of their ability to match up. Um, you know, they don't really have like – they use the closer by committee for the most part. Um, Anderson is ridiculous. Um, strikes out – I can't remember how many bat batters per nine, but it's something crazy like 15 batters per nine or something like that. Diego Castillo is still a stud. Um, I mean, they got some guys that they're not even using that are studs. Alvarado – you know, yep. been, been a stud. They're not even using him. Um, and so I'm going to give them a slight advantage. I'm not a huge believer in Kenley Jensen. I know he's, he's had his moments, but he's also had his moments the other way. 
And I would not be wanting to hand the ball to him in the ninth of a game seven. I just wouldn't. But um, would you want Dustin May's hair? Yes, I would. <laughs> that is like a lion mane, like off of the Serengeti out on the mound. Like if you're playing center, like DJ, if you're in center field, like do you have to adjust just to like – you're trying to you're trying to read the pitch coming off the bat, but there's this massive head of hair in your way. Well, it's got to be intimidating to the batter too. I mean, you're looking out there and it's like, am I going to be able to find the ball? Yeah, like where do I find it? And not to mention that he throws 100. Yeah. Yeah. He's the second hardest starting pitcher uh, – throw, second hardest throwing starting pitcher in the majors behind uh, – uh, brain fart, but yeah, he's second. He's number two, so that's crazy. Uh, for the lineups, real quick: Zunino, Willie Adamas, Mike Brousseau, G-Man Choi, Yandy Diaz, Brandon Lowe, Joey Wendell, Randy Rosarina, Kevin Kiermeyer, Miguel Mar uh, Margot, Austin Meadows, Hunter Renfro, Yoshi Susogo. These guys are loaded. Will Smith, Mac M Max Muncy, Corey Seager, Justin Turner, Matt Beatty, Edwin Rios, Mookie Betts. A.J. Pollock, Jack Peterson, Cody Bellinger, Chris Taylor, Kike Hernandez. Who's your advantage on, Brett? Well, the Dodgers have two former MVPs in their lineup, in Bellinger and Betts. Like, that's – I know Mookie didn't have a lot of uh, great work at the plate in the NLCS. He obviously had some pretty significant work with his glove. But whenever you can walk out two guys – who were former M, uh, MVPs and your all-time RBI and home run leader on the same team, that's a pretty good deal for the Dodgers. Yeah, David? I think the Dodgers have a better one through nine lineup. The difference to me in the Dodgers and the Rays is uh, the depth on the bench. And, you know, you read those names, most people wouldn't even recognize them. But the Rays know exactly when to bring those guys in. They know the, exactly the situation. And so the Yankees tried that, man. They tried to get the advantage. They threw David Garcia for an inning, uh, hoping that Hap could control those lefties. You can't do it. You can't do it. And so, like I said, one through nine, I'm going to give it to the Dodgers. But if we're including the bench in that, I'm going to give it to the Rays. Good points. I give, it, I give a slight advantage to the Dodgers on this as well. I mean, like you said, two MVPs in that lineup. They got two or three guys on that bench who would start for most teams, which is crazy. They're just absolutely loaded. The Rays do have depth. You're not you're not uh, wrong about that, David. They're they're definitely loaded too. Uh, if we're talking managers, I'm giving Cash the advantage just a little bit over Roberts. Both great managers. Should be a lot of fun, guys. Looking forward to it. It all kicks off tomorrow night, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So, well, guys, uh, unless there's anything either of you have to add. Uh, we'll wrap up here. Brad, you got anything to add? David, anybody? I was going to give you one more trivia question, but I already know that you know the answer to it, but I'll give it to you anyways. Since Go you've got it. the Rays in the World Series, who was the manager of the Rays the last time they were in the World Series? David, I'll let you take this one, buddy. Why don't you tell America who the who the guy was? Lou Pinella. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. It was that genius I Joe Madden. It, I don't want to talk about it. Joe Madden, the genius. Yeah, genius, baby. That's awesome. Well, Brad, thank you so much, man, for coming on tonight. It's good to see you again, man. It's been far too long. Uh, it's it's good to hear from you and talk to you and get pick your brain on all this stuff and hear some stories from you. So, man, we appreciate having you on. Uh, thanks for coming on tonight. David, as always, man, it's been a blast. Uh, yeah, both of you guys enjoy the World Series this week, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, America – uh, all 20 of our listeners, you know, I think we got a few few spikes in some of these crazy guys that we've had the last few weeks. So, uh, hope all you guys enjoy this podcast. We'll be back again next Monday night. So, everybody enjoying the Weird World Series, and we'll talk to you all later. All right. Thanks, guys. It's been fun.